All right. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen and individuals. Uh, my name is Dr. Josh Franco, Assistant Professor of Political Science at Cuyamaca College. Really excited to start a new semester and a new workshop. Uh, there's been a lot of innovation since the pandemic with respect to these workshops. And apparently my phone or something thinks I'm trying to talk to it. So let me make sure that that's off. <laughs> ah, the Apple Watch ever ever asking Siri. I appreciate it. So this is our new workshop called Civic Entrepreneur. And uh, this is a new series that's focused on how civic entrepreneurship, grassroots organizing, and public policy, um, or it focuses on those topics with diversity, inclusion, and equity at its core. Uh, our goal is to virtually journey throughout California and beyond and see how civic entrepreneurship and its themes are happening in real life. So this workshop is uh, Wednesdays from 6.30 to 7 p.m. via Zoom. Uh, this is our fall uh, 2022 schedule and the recording. So week one, there's no workshop. And week 14, there'll be no workshop. Uh, and there'll be no workshops in the beginning of October. Um, today, we'll have our overview. And then as we go through uh, weeks three, four, five, and six, there'll be topics that we cover. And then nine and 10 will also cover topics. I'm still debating on November. Um, whether or not we're going to have workshops or not, largely because it's election time and I kind of start to sh uh, focus on what's going on there um, in my classes and in, uh, other projects. So we might just conclude at week 10 with a, a total of seven workshops uh, for civic entrepreneur this semester. So we'll see. We'll see. All right. So again, week one, there was no workshop. And week two, the overview of it all. So civic entrepreneurship, this or civic entrepreneur in general, I founded it, and it focuses on civic entrepreneurship, grassroots organizing, and public policy with diversity, inclusion, and equity at its core. This is a picture of me uh, working on a congressional campaign. It was like one of the action shots that we got. <laughs> so I was like, this is like the best photo of me talking and engaging others. Um, so this is uh, Juan. This is uh, J Lo. This is Myra. This is Amos. This is Andrew, I think, and this is Josh Bolin, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, I have it here because it's like that cool, like getting down into the weeds and making stuff happen. Uh, grassroots organizing, but for politics, so a little different. So first, we'll start off with the question of what is diversity, inclusion, and equity? Well, this is a growing movement in education and public and private sectors to first embrace the diversity of people and cultures. So the idea is that everyone should be invited to present. Next, it's practice inclusivity by purposefully including people who might otherwise be excluded or marginalized. So this is everyone who attends, right, should be invited to contribute. And then lastly, making a concerted effort to reduce and eliminate equity gaps between genders, races, ethnicities, classes, and differently abled individuals and communities. So in other words, everyone should be uniquely supported so that they can contribute. So with that kind of framework, we'll start to look at these other concepts of uh, civic entrepreneur. So the vision of this um, is to basically positively transform communities by unleashing the creative ideas and entrepreneurial entrepreneurial energies of people, especially millennials and Gen Zs, right? So the next generation of uh, leaders uh, here in California and across the country. And we know that communities are bubbling with individuals who recognize the importance of cooperating, of collaborating and, cre and being creative in today's in increasingly interconnected world. Uh, the mission of civic entrepreneurs is to provide knowledge and practical advice on civic entrepreneurship, grassroots organizing, and public policy to strengthen their long-term social commitment, environmental stewardship, and financial prosperity. <clears throat> so what is civic entrepreneurship? Well, it combines the spirit of community and the spirit of enterprise. So a civic entrepreneur, according to um, Henton Melville and Walesh in their book, Civic Revolutionaries, they say these are individuals who operate in a time of dramatic change. They see opportunity and they mobilize other in the community to work towards their collective well-being. And uh, civic entrepreneurs create and operate at the nexuses or the nexuses between the public, the private, the nonprofit, the education and the civil sectors. Now they don't necessarily operate at all five of those, uh, the nexus of all five, they might be two of the five or three of the five or four of the five, but essentially civic entrepreneurs see collaboration and cooperation opportunities across multiple areas 
kind of not only breaking down the silos, but basically saying the silos are there, but we kind of work through them and around them and under them and over them and connecting them to turn them into uh, a positive uh, effort to transform and to uh, support a community. Uh, next question is what's grassroots organizing? So grassroots organizing is focused on empowering individuals and communities at the local level to advocate and lead change. Now there's a, the reason I, I bring this in is because I think a lot of the time, especially for students or folks who are kind of newer to thinking about how they can continue or create change in their communities, it's uh, always kind of centered on what can I do in my neighborhood? What can I do in my immediate community? What can I do in the broader area that I live in? Sometimes people have like these transformative ideas of like, how can you help change the country or how can you help change California, which I think is a very valuable thought to have in conversation to begin with. And at the same time, I think it's important that we encourage folks to think about and to be supported at what can they do at the local level to advocate and lead change. So grassroots organizing includes things like lobbying and advocacy efforts, uh, conducting asset mapping and power analyses, implementing political empowerment programs, and supporting and emerging, uh, emerging and established policy leaders. So it's really about the people power that comes about with being an uh, in a local community or in a broader kind of regional community and to not just say, well, I'm, I'm only can do this, or I only could influence that or only could be involved here. It's really saying it's a multifaceted effort, um, that you can bring to bear. Like for example, lobbying your city council or conducting an asset map of what resources are available in a County or in a region, uh, implementing political empowerment programs, particularly for underrepresented and marginalized communities and supporting and, uh, supporting established and emerging leaders. So those folks who are kind of working their way up, um, politics and the community in general, and for those who are already there, but they might need a little bit more support so that some of their more novel ideas or novel approaches to governance and government and uh, business and community in general can kind of get to the next level. Uh, next is what is public policy? So public policy is a constitutional, legal, judicial, regulatory, or policy documents that are produced by governmental institutions at the international, national, and subnational level. So the key here is that any individual, whether you're young or old, rich or poor, liberal or conservative, that you can help shape public policy. You can be involved in the process of, of <laughs> where trees are planted, right? Where roads are improved, where sidewalks uh, are fixed, where street lamps uh, are uh, brightened, uh, where affordable housing, where housing goes and ensuring that it's affordable for folks uh, in, in the region or the community. Um, saying where public parks uh, should be taken care of or uh, where programs for neighborhood watches and other things to improve a sense of community and sense of safety, um, where uh, new businesses should be located or where uh, empty lots, uh, underutilized resources should be uh, invested in so they can be um, uh, put to a more productive use. So all these things and more are parts of public policy. And most of the times when we think of public policy, we kind of think it at this macro level, like, oh, that's the Supreme Court or that's what the Congress does or that's what the governor does. And again, that's important to have and to know that there are these connections with there or, or uh, among there. But the key here is like, you can make change, right? That you can be a part of shaping how we govern our communities. And a lot of the time, I think what I've seen now since this uh, this idea of civic entrepreneurship kind of budded, budded in my mind after reading a couple of books, which I'll point out in a moment, um, what I realized is like, we're still in times of dramatic change, right? But the change is not only external to like what's going on in the world, but it's kind of internal too, uh, with respect to what's going on in the United States and, 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 and in other co uh, countries around the world and kind of just what's happening with a society. Like we're basically um, having a generational shift. We're starting to uh, see some of the long-term implications come to life. Um, and the next generation is getting older and getting ready and in a place to say, let's do something about um, what's going on in uh, our communities in our state and in the country and in the world today. So why talk about diversity, inclusion, and equity? So we defined it a moment ago, right? But what's the utility of having it as a part of this broader conversation about civic entrepreneurship? So the first question is like, why embrace the diversity of people and cultures, right? Well, first, we're all human. <laughs> we're all doing our thing on this planet. 
And we know that each of us have unique experiences that shapes who we are, shapes our understanding, shapes our engagement with ideas and with other people. And so we should be willing to welcome that conversation with people who are different from us, who have those unique uh, attributes, features, uh, experiences different from our own to kind of be a part of this broader uh, uh, fabric of a community and of a society as a whole. Now, next question is like, why practice inclusivity by purposefully including people who might otherwise be excluded or marginalized, right? So for example, if someone is welcome to church, right, they should also be invited to worship, right? If someone's hired to work in a company or business, they should be invited to contribute their time and talents in unexpected ways. And if someone's encouraged to speak up, then their voice should obviously be acknowledged and their experience heated in meaningful ways. So the idea is like, <clears throat> where everyone's here, we're all different, we're doing our thing. And when you want to include someone, you don't just say, oh, you know, sit here and that's it. It's like, no, sit here, listen, engage in, a con engage in the discussion, ask questions, challenge others, push the envelope, be a part of not just the conversation, but be a part of the action that comes from the conversations. And um, so that's why we want to practice inclusivity. And then lastly, like why make a concerted effort to reduce and eliminate equity gaps between genders, races, ethnicities, classes, and differently abled individuals and communities? Well, sadly, enduring legacies of constitutional legal exclusions have established these gaps, right? I think it's become more commonly understood now than even five years ago and even 10 years ago and definitely 20 years ago where kind of we took for granted the way and the, where, the world in which we lived. And a lot of the things we didn't ask questions about, and we didn't challenge the assumptions that we functionally operated on. And so one of those assumptions was like, okay, this is how it is. But we know now uh, with a lot more reflection, a lot more strain, a lot more struggle, a lot more heartache, uh, and a lot more um, uh, just pain, honestly, that these enduring legacies rooted in um and constitutional exclusion or legal exclusions establish gaps that need to be remedied. Uh, we know that over time, these gaps have shaped generations of individuals, of communities and peoples. And so it's, it's important that we don't just say, well, that the past is the past and we're here now. Well, of course we're here now, but if we don't have that appreciation for how the past has shaped the opportunities or the lack thereof for individuals and communities throughout here in California or throughout the country, or even arguably around the world, then we're not really heeding the, the the old adage of like you know learn from the past or you're gonna re, or, you, or learn from the mistakes of the past or you're doomed to repeat them. We don't want to do that as civic entrepreneurs. We want to kind of think ahead. And lastly, we have to acknowledge that our own experiences, our advantages, our disadvantages, so that we can help ourselves and each other build on them and to overcome them. So it's not enough to say, okay, I know there's this painful past and you know it's kind of led to this disadvantage or that disadvantage, but you know kind of shrug your shoulders. And the answer is like, no, once you acknowledge it, once you see it, then you got to make those concerted efforts to help uh, not only yourself, but others overcome them uh, in the professional workplace, in a community, in a region, at school, um, in, in kindergarten, all the way up to, you know, a PhD program um, and the like. So this is why diversity, inclusion, and equity are important to us in this space. So there are some foundational books that civic entrepreneurship is rooted in, and I would say they uh, coined the term. So the first one is this book, Grassroots Leaders for a New Economy by uh, Douglas Henton, John Melville, and Kimberly uh, Walesh. And it's like Grassroots Leaders for a New Economy, How Civic Entrepreneurs Are Building Prosperous Communities. And luckily, I have my copy of the book here, which... This actually, even though it's the first book, it wasn't the first one I read. I read the one on the, the other one, but I have my book here, which is pretty cool. Um, it was a library book, <laughs> so I had to pay. I had to. I had to. I had to pay a uh, fine because I lost it for a while. Um, but <laughs> you gotta do what you. Um, you know, when you check out a book, you gotta return it. If you don't, <laughs> you gotta pay for it. So the first book I actually read was Civic Revolutionaries, and here's um, one of my copies of it. I have another one in my office that's actually written up. And I read this back in 2006, seven, somewhere thereabouts. I was in uh, college university, and I was just like, this gives a word to what I want to do. This gives a word to uh, what we can do together if we work together. This gives a word 
to the kind of people that I want to be around and with and supportive of. And to now in my you know day and age as a professor at the community college is to help inspire that next generation who are going to uh, keep moving the ball up the mountain uh, and making uh, change big and small uh, here and there. So a little bit more about these books. The chapters of the Grassroots Leaders book talks about these four kind of themes. One of them is initiation, which is networking and motivating change. Uh, incubation, which is setting shared priorities. Uh, implementation, which is mobilizing resources to get things done. And then lastly is improvement and renewal. So helping the community change continuously. Um, as I kind of read through the book and began to, you know, I take my notes here and there. And I began to internalize these concepts. I was like, yeah, like this is, they basically provide a model and number of examples throughout to show how people are initiating, how they're incubating, how they're implementing and how they're improving and renewing. And it's just great to see these examples because then you can uh, build on them going forward. Uh, with the Civic Revolutionaries book, um, there's uh, six chapters. I mean, there's a, a seven or eight. There's a few more chapters, but the six core chapters are first about individual and community creating common purpose. The next one is trust and accountability, building webs of responsibility. <laughs> Third is uh, economy and society, so strengthening uh, this vital cycle between the two. Uh, people in place, making the creative connection. Uh, the fifth is change and continuity, so creating vigilance and renewal. And then lastly is idealism and pragmatism, so building resilience of place. Um, this book was great because it's like just got into more detail, gave more poignant uh, examples about how things can be done to bring about uh, change uh, in communities. And um, to wrap it up in this sense, um, I went to a conference in Florida, and I was in Fort Lauderdale, uh, at the time that the organization was called the Alliance for Regional Stewardship. And that's where I got to sit down and talk with and learn more about the work uh, with Doug and with John. And it was just so great to like be a part of this conversation that I saw that they were leading, um, not just in uh, with the Alliance for Regional Stewardship, but all around the country to get people to think differently, to get people to see that at the time in their framework, the, the change was globalization, was international trade, was a disruption in communities uh, around, the, around the country because basically you're moving economic product, productivity from one place overseas. And seeing kind of this, uh, in some places, the hollowing out of the middle class and in other places, uh, the slow decline in other uh, uh, places, this like incredible growth. And then they really went in and talked about how do people go about realizing that the challenges that they face or the struggles that they have, if you have folks who are civic entrepreneurs, they can really help turn things around because they're not stuck in one place. They're not stuck in one point of view. They're not stuck uh, in saying that this is how it is. They're really people who are motivated to move and uh, to shake and to bake and to get things done. So the six things that we'll focus on over the next uh, six workshops, obviously with that break in, in early October, are the six themes from Civic Revolutionary. Uh, revolutionary. So individual and community, trust and accountability, economy and society, people in place, change and continuity, and idealism and pragmatism. And I'm still kind of deciding if I want to focus on just one theme and keep going, or in this case, kind of focus on a place and a person and then talk about you know one to maybe three or four or even all of them how that person is embodying or that organization's embodying or taking into action or putting this uh, you know these concepts into uh, uh, reality so I'm still debating that so we'll see how it goes uh, next week I'll I'll be thinking about it for the next uh, seven days <laughs> so with that I want to thank you for taking the time to listen in uh, we'll go ahead and jump to our discussion and I look forward to uh, having you attend these workshops or listening to them um, uh, when you get a chance. So take care and have a great uh, uh, rest of your day.